Joining me now is former Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Her new book is Oath and Honor, a Memoir and a Warning. It's very uh, briskly written and a great historical record, um, but it's a good read Thank you. also. So congratulations. The book opens uh, two days after the 2020 election. Uh, you're talking to then uh, leader Kevin McCarthy. He tells you that Donald Trump, uh, quote, knows it's over and that he needs time to, quote, go through the stages of grief. And then... Almost immediately, you see this on Fox News. President Trump won this election, so everyone who's listening, do not be quiet. Do not be, do not be silent about this. We cannot allow this to happen before our very eyes. This is a theme throughout the book, so much so I could fill an hour uh, of examples of, of Kevin McCarthy saying something to you that is rational and reality-based, yeah. and then going on TV and doing the exact opposite. For example, saying he's going to withdraw objections to the electoral count and then doing the exact opposite. You go so far as to, at one point, Donald Trump uses um, a word, uh, a, a euphemism, a feline euphemism, uh, to describe Kevin McCarthy, and you, you agree with him, with Donald Trump. But it's worse than that because that cravenness, in your view, uh, it really puts the country in jeopardy. Right. Why? Right. Why is he like that? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't know the why, but, but what I can tell you is, you know, it, it became very clear that it, it, when you're the leader and each time you have a choice to make and you decide that you're going to do the wrong thing, you lead the whole conference in that direction. Now, there were people that were very certainly willing to go with him, but... You know, situations, for example, uh, like when, when the issue of objecting to electoral votes came up, and you had these freshman members who had just been elected. They hadn't been in office more than a couple of days, and they were being asked to cast this crucially important vote. Are you going to object to electoral votes? It was clear there was no basis in the Constitution for them to do so. And I had a couple of them tell me that Kevin was meeting with them privately, telling them this isn't that big a deal, really. You know, the easy political vote is just to go ahead and object. And, and when you think about the damage that does when it's the leader uh, and he's actually telling people, don't, don't worry, essentially, about your constitutional obligations, here's the political expedient path to take. And, and of course, you know, the, we, saw, we saw where that led Republicans through the course of, of you know, the months leading up to January 6th and afterwards. And a lot of them were led by the nonsense being spewed by these attorneys, Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, Jenna Ellis. Um, there has been some admission that they were wrong, at least Jenna Ellis, who said this in a Georgia court. I endeavored to represent my client to the best of my ability. I relied on others, including lawyers with many more years of experience than I, to provide me with true and reliable information. What I did not do, but should have done, Your Honor, was to make sure that the facts the other lawyers alleged to be true were, in fact, true. And then she talks as if she's like an eight-year-old. She's a grown adult. Um, but still, at least she did that. Sidney Powell, Rudy Giuliani still have not admitted that their actions were wrong. What do you think justice would look like for these attorneys that so misled the nation? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you've... You've seen um, in both of those cases, in the case of Rudy Giuliani, his license to practice law has been suspended. Uh, I mean, Sidney Powell's assertion uh, in, in uh, one of the Dominion cases was that no, no reasonable person would actually believe the claims that she was making. <laughs> right. um, so, Which is true, by the way. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but an interesting defense for her to be making. And, and I think it's, it's really a, a situation where people ought to imagine that if Donald Trump were to have a second term, these are the kind of of unethical lawyers that he would have around him, those who are willing to help him um, violate the law. And, and I think that's a, something people need to keep in mind as they, they look at 2024. He would not have around him the kinds of people like Pat Cipollone, for example, Jeff Rosen, uh, Rich Donahue, the people that actually stopped him from doing uh, even more damage yeah, this last time around. But do you think having their licenses to practice law being taken away, do you think these slaps on the wrist that they've gotten is enough. Do you think that there need to be more serious charges? I think it's very important. You know, we've, we've looked at what the Department of Justice, how they began their investigations uh, about around January 6th. They began with, um, you know, in some ways the foot soldiers. They began with the people who invaded the Capitol. And um, I think it's very important that they now have expanded that. Uh, that that's got to go all the way up to the top. Accountability is really crucially important. Without accountability for everybody, uh, including Donald Trump, including those lawyers uh, around him, those others around him who helped him with his, his plot to overturn the election. Without that accountability, 
you can be confident this is going to happen again and again. See, I think it's very likely that in a second Trump term, we would see a leadership role of some sort uh, for Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. Mm. And you might recall, I know you recall, yeah. on December 7th, Paxton petitioned the Supreme Court to challenge the election results in a number of states that Biden won. Yeah. In response, then Congressman Mike Johnson, who was a friend uh, and fellow a colleague of yours, he was in your incoming freshman class, he sent an email to House Republicans that read, quote, President Trump called me this morning to express his great appreciation for our effort to file an, an amicus brief in the Texas case. He specifically asked me to contact all Republican members of the House and Senate today and request that all join on our to our brief. Trump said he will be anxiously awaiting the final list to review. He was pushing this forward. He was misrepresenting actually what the amicus brief said. Do you think that, that Mike Johnson, uh, I know that you liked him at the time, do you think that he actually believed what was in the, that amicus brief? I think that he was uh, aware that what he was doing uh, was wrong. Um, and that was both with respect to the amicus brief as well as with respect to the objections and the assertions he was making. He had this stunning uh, sort of a claim that he kept making, which was that uh, because we are convinced, that those are the words he used, because Congress, in his, term, in his phrase, was convinced mm -hmm. that states had violated the Constitution, we had the authority to throw out electoral votes. Um, you know, that is a stunning assertion to make, and it ignores the rulings of the courts, and it ignores the certification process that went on in each of those states. With, with uh, the uh, amicus brief, he kept assuring members that this really was not a, a brief that was making claims about the facts, but in fact, it was making claims about the facts, and it was making claims that had already been heard and rejected by courts in each of these states, by federal courts, and state courts. And, and so while each member of Congress is obviously responsible for anything they sign, and they all, you know, should have been reading that brief, the fact that Johnson was, you know, again and again claiming, um, in this case, knowledge of facts uh, about irregularities in the election, um, you know, about which he, he had no basis uh, himself to know. And I think that that raised serious ethical questions. Um, and, of course, you know, the court within a couple of hours of, of uh, receiving the amicus brief, declined to hear the case. He's now the Speaker of the House. He's number two in line for the presidency. Do you think that our democracy is at risk with Mike Johnson as Speaker of the House? Uh, I do think that um, we have to be very concerned about the fact that he has shown um, a willingness to, to take steps that he knows to be wrong in order to placate Donald Trump. And um, that was the thing that surprised me the most, I think. Uh, I had not understood that that was Mike's character. I, th I thought that he was a man of character and a man of honor. Um, but, but when I watched again and again and again throughout this period, um, his willingness, you know, essentially to do things without any basis in law. And it wasn't just me. I talk in the book about uh, Kevin McCarthy's own chief legal counsel, who herself confronted Johnson um, about the flaws in his arguments, and, and she emailed me and said he knows he's wrong, um, and yet he was, he was continuing to do it anyway. So when you have somebody with that approach who's the vice chair of the Republican conference, you know, you can make the case it's, it's not as dangerous. I was obviously concerned enough about it that I wrote these parts of the book before he was speaker. When you have somebody who's willing to do that who's speaker of the House, it really does, I think, present a significant threat. And you imagine January 6, 2025, when the new House is counting electoral votes. Imagine the possibility that the election gets thrown into the House. And, um, and I think it's important that he not be the speaker that day. It's pretty amazing, actually, because other than Kevin McCarthy, it's probably Mike Johnson that you write about the most in terms of members of Congress that were collaborators, co-conspirators with Donald Trump. And, and you obviously wrote it before he was Speaker of the House. That shows, right. that shows how much you were concerned about the role he played.